Hello everyone and welcome back to Programming in Access 2013, the advanced course. My name is Steve Bishop and in today's video we're going to be talking about creating an installation package. Now typically if you ask online for what are my options to install uh, or to create an installation package for Access, you're going to most likely hear about Access 2010. And that's because Microsoft released with Access 2010 the Package Solution Wizard. Because Access 2013 databases are backwards compatible with Access 2010, you can go ahead and take your database, put it on a system that currently has Access 2010, and go ahead and use the Package Solution Wizard to create your MSI package. And you can see there's a nice little, uh, I have a link here on the page, uh, goes to www.addictivetips.com, where you can go ahead and go to this link and uh, I'll make sure that it's available in the description, but it's a nice little step-by-step -step walkthrough about how to use Access 2010 in order to create your, uh, your installation package. Now, there's a couple of problems here with Access 2010 to create the installation package. First and foremost, uh, you need to have Access 2010. Not everybody's going to have that. Not everybody still has a version of 2010 lying around somewhere. The other thing is that uh, I have found through my personal experience that if I try to run a database, a 2013 database, in 2010, I end up breaking my application in some way or another. So I really do not recommend you ever put Access 2010 and 2013 on the same system. And secondly, I would not run your application in 2010. So if you built your application in 2013, you have an installation in 2010 somewhere on your network and you copy the file over to that other computer, don't run the application. Just simply open it using the, the shift key so that you can get into the developer options and then just go straight into the save and publish and package solution wizard. So now that we've gone and talked about Access 2010, what are the other options that are out there? If I don't have Access 2010, what can I do? Well, there are some um, package wizard builders that are out there. But for me, the one that I prefer is SSE Setup. That's the first one I have listed here. SSE Setup is the one that I'm going to demonstrate in this video. And I think once you see some of the functionality of it and the ease of use, you guys are also going to want to use SSE Setup. These other installers are not bad. They do the job. Uh, but they're really not geared towards access. They don't really make it easy for access development uh, to, be, to be distributed and installed. So let's go ahead and hop out here, and I'm going to show you. First and foremost, you can get SSE set up by just going to sssetup.com. Let me just take this little challenge part off of here. So you can go to sssetup.com. So you're going to go to download it, the download it section of SSE setup website. And you're, of course, just going to go ahead and click on the download. It's a small little file. It's less than six megs. So once you do the installation, you're going to have the little desktop icon. I'm just going to go ahead and double click on it. And that will, of course, open up the interface. Let's go ahead and start a new project. So we'll go ahead and click on that. Program name, we'll call it Northwind. Let's go Northwind ACCDB. Okay. <clears throat> so this is not the installation file. This is the actual file that does everything. So if, if I was building an executable binary out of .NET, then it would be the .exe file that actually runs. But in this case, since it's an access database, it's just ACCDB. Then of course, you're gonna put your company name, which I'm just gonna put Northwind Trading Company, and then a website if you wanna include that. You can select a default template or another template if there was another one built, but right now, since we haven't done any other project development, it's just gonna be default. And go ahead and click on Start. Okay, so now, we have our uh, program name is right here, which we could change if we wanted to, but that's probably ill-advised. Uh, you could change your version number if what you initially put in was incorrect, but you can certainly change that version number. You can also select whether or not it's beta or a free, quote unquote, free version. Now, under um, this program folder, this is the actual directory that you want to put all of the files. I'm gonna select use default here, and typically this is what's selected uh, when you first run the SSE setup. Um, using the default, you can see under program folder, it types in program files and then creates a subdirectory of Northwind 1.0. So default just basically means program files, Northwind 
When it comes to access though, this is very, very bad. Uh, you do not want to install your access databases anywhere in the program files directory. There's some sort of security locking mechanism or something that just makes it so that the databases are constantly in read-only mode. Instead, I'm going to unselect use default, and you'll see there's a drop down here for the program file, uh, program folder. I can select a multitude of different locations to put this. If you try to pick the Windows system folder or uh, anything else that really is kind of tied to the user specific instance, you may very well run into some uh, credential issues when they try to run the application. It'll actually cause problems. So I typically just pick the root drive and then just whatever the name of the folder is going to be, which is just created based upon what the program name is and the version number. Here you can also select what the setup type is going to be. You can also specify if it's supposed to be a 64-bit program installation. So you can select 32-bit or 64-bit, and you can even write registry statements to the 32-bit registry. You can also say, I don't want to include an uninstall process. So doing that is really a bad practice, and they even tell you. Uh, you should probably go ahead and leave the uninstall option available for your users. On the left-hand side, you see the menu here, and you can go to any one of these sections. Um, or you can just simply click on the next button and that will take you to the next section. Okay, so prerequisites. Well, this is a really, I, I think the prerequisites page is the most important page and why SSE setup is head and shoulders above all of the other wizards when it comes to access installation. This is a very nice, easy to use graphical user interface, I think, that allows us to do several different things. First, you can specify the different system requirements, right? Space size, uh, RAM size, CPU, speed, cores. But you can also select which operating systems the user is allowed to have. And I don't want them to be able to run this on XP or Server 2003, or heck, I don't even, I hate Vista so much, let's just not even do that, which basically Server 2008 is a version of Vista. But here you can also specify, well, hold on, I don't want them to be able to install it on any server installation. I don't want them to be able to run it on server at all. They must be running either 7, 8, 8.1, or 10 of Windows. But uh, I'm just going to go ahead and untick all these back up. And there we go. So that's where you can specify the prerequisites of what the operating system is. Now down here, it's probably the most useful section of the entire SSE setup. The software prerequisites. What other software must be installed in order for this installation process to work. And if I double click here where it says requirement name, it's going to give me a bunch of already created prerequisites. We can go ahead and select the access, uh, access or access runtime must be installed in order for this installation process to work. Now if I select that, kind of a buggy little thing about SSE setup, and I, I hope he fixes this, but just doing that, unfortunately, it, it doesn't show that you've selected it there. It's still blank, but trust me, it's been selected. Once you click anywhere else outside of that, it's going to pop up this access deployment page. And here you can specify the minimum version to require. But if I really wanted to be really strict about it, I could say, look, you need to have the full Access 2013 Service Pack 1 installed, and you must re you must have that specific inver uh, version installed. So we can also specify whether or not it works in 32-bit or 64-bit or both, which, of course, mine works in both. And here is another kicker, and I love this, automatically add trusted location info for my app database. So it's going to automatically add the location information so that you don't get that trust requirement all the time when you try to open up the database. Now, if the conditions are not met that we just had at that last screen, what do we want the user to do? Well, we can allow the user to download and install from within the setup. So once again, Chris has gone and done all the legwork for us here and allows us to have the user download the runtime edition of Access from right within the setup. Now we, look, we go to the looks of the installer. We can have a welcome message and even include the version number. And that's a little splash screen that pops up on the screen. We can use left image, or we can change the left image and the small image. Show the progress bar, so you can have a progress bar on the installation process. 
You can even show a fire animation if you really want to be fancy. And then you can allow for an about button while the installation process is going. You can have the user click on an about button to look at the information. Message on startup. I'm just going to go ahead and leave this blank again, but of course you could put some sort of message to your user. Here we uh, have a message on folder change, and I think for us access developers this is kind of important. Um, do not install to the program files directory. Then finally we have on the screen we can also give a message when the user has successfully installed the application. But typically just the fact that they've gone all the way through the process and they don't get any errors is usually a good enough indication that they've been successful. So I'm just going to go ahead and leave that blank. And now we'll click on next here to go to the language text. And you can see we have different options from Chinese, Dutch, uh, French, German, Italian, Japanese, Korean, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish. And you can also load your own up. You can create your own. Go ahead and click on next. And now we finally get to the part where we're selecting which files we're actually going to install to the user system. And you can see, use the ellipsis button to select a file to install, or you can use the folder button to select an entire folder full of files to install. So I can select, if I have a big large project with multiple files in it, I can select the folder here, the folder icon, and go through and find that Northwind directory or uh, whatever directory contains all the files and click OK. And it's just going to go and get all of the files in that directory and include them as the, in the package. For my specific case, though, I'm just going to click on the ellipsis here and grab the Northwind ACCDB file. Now, additionally, I want to have an icon on the desktop and on the start button. So I want a start menu item and I want a desktop icon. And you have to include the icon file as part of the installation files. OK, so I'm going to click on the ellipsis again. And here you can see I have this radiation icon that I downloaded from the Internet. I can also set up some attributes to these files when they get installed. And you can see right here, double click the attribute column to set the attributes. Left, left in column is hidden. Right in column is read only or writable. So I want to talk a little bit about this little directory here because we'll see this throughout the rest of the process. This install program folders, this destination folder that it's trying to say is where do you want the ACCDB file to go? And here by default, we have install program folder. The install program folder that's mentioned here refers to back up here where we said the program folder is the root drive Northwind 10. So anytime that you see install program folder, that really means whatever I have selected up here as the program folder. You can double click here and actually change it. But once again, just make sure you're not really doing something that's going to break your application by putting it in some sort of directory that it won't work. OK, so we're good there. Let's go to the next stage, which is talking about shortcuts. And by default, it wants to create a couple of them, a start menu. And actually, let's start up here. We have an uninstall type. And this is the uninstaller that comes with SSE setup. And when you go and install your application, it's going to actually install an uninstall executable file. So here we have for these two items, the location of the file and the file name. So here we're just pointing to the ACCDB file, which is the actual file that the user will be running when they click on the link. So when they go to click on the shortcut item uh, icon, it's going to open up the Northwind ACCDB file that exists in install program folder. And you can see the location of the shortcut is desktop or a start menu. And here we have, by default, there is no icon. That's what this question mark is for. There's no icon with the shortcut. So how do we specify that icon that we included? Well, if you go over here to this little package icon here, it's kind of small, but if you click on it, You'll see it opens up the files that we included with the package, and there's our radiation icon file. So we'll go ahead and click OK. And I'm going to do the same for the other desktop icon. And now we have some uniformity between both of those shortcuts. They both have the same icon and are named the same thing, and that makes things really nice. Now, additionally, you can allow the admin user to choose to install shortcuts from just themselves or for all users. So I typically like this because then that allows them to go ahead and add an icon for everybody on the system. 
user can edit or uh, enable or disable creation of start menu program shortcuts. By default, we probably want that to be checked though. So over here on the left is enabling and disabling the capability of adding the shortcut. On the right is saying whether or not we want that to be the default. Then we're going to go to the next section here, and this is just some miscellaneous items. Then you can do an, a URL either uh, after the, in, the installation or uninstallation. So if you want to say, uh, you know, if they uninstall and you want to find out why, maybe you take them to a survey page. Then when it comes to the add remove program icon, we probably want to go ahead and select the same icon here that we selected for all our other stuff. So I'm going to go and pick on the package again. There's our radiation icon. And now we're setting this icon to be in the add remove programs section. Okay, so next we have run programs. These are any additional software pieces that after the installation is done, should we run these applications? So I don't have anything like that. So I'm just going to go ahead and click on next. This is the uninstallation process. Are there any additional programs that I need to run in order to complete the uninstall process? No, there's not. Uh, any uninstall files, any special files that might be out there that may not be included with the installation process that we d declared up here? Uh, no, I don't have anything here for this example, but if you did have some other file that you want to make sure you delete, then you can certainly do that. And then uh, finally here we have the registry section, so you can uninstall a registry entry. Uh, if you had included one earlier, you can go ahead and uninstall it here. The next, this has to do with the internet update. Now, I going through this process, the setup of the internet process would just take a long time to do, and that would really need to be another video. But you can go ahead and click on this link right here, the Interfacing Your Software with Internet Update module. And it'll take you through some instructions about how you can set up the capability of pushing out your updates online and your users will automatically be notified that there are new uh, updates. SSE setup actually comes with its own module that goes and checks the website for you. And if there is a new version, that module will prompt the user to say, we found a new version of the software. Do you want to go ahead and download it? But one thing you will need to do if you are going to be doing the module, uh, this, up, this internet update module, <clears throat> you will need to include in your program something that triggers that module. So you just need to write a little bit of code that when the application first starts that it runs an exe as a shell command, something like that. One of the best features I think of the SSE setup is that it just makes that whole process darn near automated. It's, it's almost automatic. You just simply make your changes, publish them up online, and all your users will now see that you have made a change and they'll get prompted to have the new version downloaded. It's really, really nice. So any additional information, our information, like if we want to change the publisher name or the website, uh, if we want to change the installer description, um, uninstaller description, add a copyright bit of information. We can even do a digital signature on the installer uh, so that we can sign with our digital signature. Now, finally, we get to the last stage here where we can actually save our package. What's the executable name? I'm just going to go ahead and leave the file name just as it is. Now, I'm selecting this as a self-extracting archive. So this is going to be an executable file that is self-extracting. You could do it as a zip file instead. So instead of an exe, you just want a zip file. Or you can do a CD or DVD, and you can have a label and put your uh, put a disk in your drive and just burn it to a DVD or CD. So that really makes um, the distribution of your software very, very handy. Now, I could just do save and exit, and this just kind of saves the project without creating that, that distribution file. Typically, you're going to want to do save, create distribution, and exit. This will go ahead and create the executable file that you can then distribute. This bottom one, save, create distribution, and publish, is for when you have a, uh, a, a website that you're doing the internet updates through. That little section that I was talking about here with the internet update. Um, but typically, if you're not doing the internet update, you're just going to click on save, create, distribu uh, create distribution, and exit. Uh, so that's what I'm going to go ahead and click here. And you can see it's pretty quick. It just goes and creates the package for us. And uh, we just have to wait a moment here while it does this. And I'm just going to go ahead and pause the video and then come back once it's ready.
Okay, so after the uh, distribution package was created, it actually exited us out of that, uh, that version so that we don't accidentally go in there and make any sort of changes. And it actually went ahead and opened up the folder where the executable got dropped into, where it was created. So we can go ahead and copy this file, and we can go ahead and now put it wherever we want. And I'm just going to go ahead and put this in our Northwind folder here. And this is now the full installation. This is the installation package, Northwind 10.exe. And the user would just simply click on this or double click on this in order to run the installation process. Additionally, I just kind of want to show you here on the main page. So now we have our program name, which is the project that we created, Northwind. And you can even see the version number. So the version number, the last version that we created a, a uh, a, a package for was 1.0 and it even gives us the location uh, I can't change this but it just tells us where the location is I can do several different things now to this version I can either open this version up for editing I can create distributions or publish distributions uh, creating the uh, creating the distributions is what we just did where we created the exe the published distributions is where you actually publish back out to the internet your new uh, executables. Edit Publish IUI has to do with a spe special file that is out on your website that indicates to all of your applications that there's been a new version. You can even delete the project entirely, or you can navigate to the project folder. So if I click on this and just go to do it, it'll actually just take me back here to the folder where all of the different pieces that SSE setup requires in order to create the package are. Now, if I have a new release, say I have some changes on the Northwind database, and I need to make a new version release, you don't do it under the existing projects, okay? You want to go over here and select new version and start new project. If you go back into open for editing and then click on do it, you're just going to be opening up that same version number that we were working on. So these are all the same settings that we were just that we just had. The problem is, is that you once you have actually pushed out a release, you don't want to go back and change it because now which version do your users have? So the only time you really want to do this is if you haven't pushed out this version yet. You may have created the package, but you haven't distributed it to anyone yet and you realize that you made a mistake. That would be the only time that you ever want to reopen the same version. Instead, what you want to do is go back to the main page and say, I want to start a new project, even though you're just really creating a new version. It says start new project. But as long as you have selected Northwind, then you can click on this and it even prompts you to say, what's the program name you want to continue on with? It's going to be Northwind. What's the version number? It's going to be 1.01. .01. And base this project based upon this template. So I can bring back all of the settings that I had from before, from that previous version that I created, I can bring all those same settings back into this version that I'm going to create. So let's go ahead and click on start. And now you can see it's just basically going to be the same process all over again, but now the version number is 1.1. And I have beta selected for some reason. Oh, because it automatically becomes, uh, it automatically thinks it's a beta version because of the way I have this numbered. Um, Yes. Okay. So 1.1 would probably be better. So let's change this to 1.1. And uh, okay. So now we see a little bit more of an option here with what we can do with our upgrades. Since this is considered an upgrade, right? We're upgrading from 1.0 to 1.1. So once again, we have the option of saying either this is a brand new program installation or more typically an application with upgrade support. Okay. And we have the same options as before. Really, the only difference here is this bottom section. Upgrade settings, versions to upgrade. So we want to upgrade version 1.0 and check it. So we're just checking to make sure that Northwind 1.0 is one of the versions that we are upgrading from. Run any additional EXE when upgrading this version? No, I don't. So this would be like if I had anything special based upon versions, because you can imagine this version numbering might get pretty long. Maybe you have, maybe you're up to version eight. Well, you've had several different iterations uh, or several different versions between 1.0 and eight. 
maybe there's something special that you need to do if someone's still running the 1.0 to get them up to a certain standard that then you can go ahead and uh, upgrade them to your latest version after they run this executable. Everything else moving through this is identical. All the same conditions and everything are the same for an upgrade as they are to a brand new installation. So I'm going to go ahead and quit. And there we go. Uh, now I'm going to go ahead and go into my virtual box, my sandbox, and grab a copy. Now I already still have the runtime edition of, um, of uh, access on this sandbox PC. I'm just going to go ahead and copy this and paste the executable now to my computer. And if I double click on this, it's going to take us through the wizard here. First, we're going to get prompted for the uh, UA, UAC because I did not specify that they wouldn't be prompted for this. So by default, we will. Okay, so here we have our first screen from the installation process, and you can see it wants to put it in that Northwind 1.0 directory on our root drive, and it does give the option of the user to change the directory. Let's go ahead and click on Next, and then here's just the standard uh, agreement that just comes with the um, SSE, uh, SSE setup. You could change this in, I, we didn't really go over this, but you can actually change this uh, to be something else if you want. I'm gonna go ahead and say, I have read this, understand and agree to it. Click on next and it goes and installs the file. And now we're gonna be getting the shortcuts built. So there's the desktop shortcut right there. You can see uh, we are now have the option to actually open the file. I'm just going to go ahead and uncheck this for right now. It just says Northwind has been successfully installed on your computer. Click OK. And now I should be able to also go to my start menu here. All apps. If I go into all apps here and I scroll down, there's our Northwind 1.0. And if I click on the drop down, there is our Northwind database. So I can even click on the icon here and that will now go and open up our Northwind application. So there you have it. There's a very um, easy to, to perform installation process. It's uh, you know it's a nice little wizard. It's it may not be um, oh, oh that's a really wonderful thing. Remember in the last video when we were doing the runtime edition and we're talking about the little security error message. Notice how we don't have it here. That's because of the option that we selected earlier in the SSC setup. It automatically as it to your uh, as your uh, to your locations for access. So we have full capabilities with this database, and we don't get that security warning. So anyway, I just thought that's really really fantastic. I think SSE setup is really a wonderful tool for getting all of this set up and uh, and ready to go on our users' systems without having to do all of the installation process ourselves manually. I hope that you guys find SSE setup as useful as I have in your own project. Uh, if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to drop me a line in the comments section below of this video, and uh, I'll be happy to answer them as best as I can. Thank you so much.